Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season, we're addressing the parts of the old law which remain valid and grave today, the Ten Commandments. So far, we've talked about the first four commandments, and now it's time to tackle the fifth, Thou shalt not kill. We've begun talking about whether particular actions can be considered murder, and now, what does it mean to rob someone of their bodily integrity? Is it murder? The Catechism lists bodily integrity in two paragraphs under the heading of murder, paragraphs 2297 and 2298. The phrase bodily integrity seems to imply a certain kind of physical injury which one person is causing to another. The question is, since you're not actually taking anyone's life, how can this be murder? How can this view possibly be defended? Here's how. Suppose that the person in question is a carpenter by trade. They depend on the use of their hands and arms to support the lives of themselves and or their family. Then you come along and break both of their thumbs. Now, this injury is not, by its nature, fatal. They probably will still live a very long life and may even, in time, regain the use of their thumbs. But they can never use them to stay competitive in the business of carpentry again. They might be able to build a table, but it would take twice as long as before, and little by little, they slash their family would slide into poverty and perhaps even starvation. You can't tell me that the guy who broke the carpenter's thumbs isn't guilty of murder in that case. Breaking things like arms, legs, shoulder blades, and even causing a severe loss of blood can result in horrible medical consequences as well, which prevent a human being from functioning at the top of their game, and often from surviving. That's why we should treat all of these as though they were murder. However, that's just the general summary of why robbing a person of bodily integrity is considered murder. The actual passages in the Catechism also get into some specifics of how this can be done. Kidnapping and hostage-taking bring on a reign of terror. By means of threats, they subject their victims to intolerable pressures. Catechism, paragraph 2297, first sentence. It's important not to misinterpret this passage. The phrase intolerable pressures does not refer to emotional strain. We're talking not just about the inflicting of physical harm, but the impairing of a person's ability to function through forcibly relocating them. Suppose their employer didn't realize they'd been kidnapped, and as a result they lost their job. Suppose that they weren't there when they were needed by their family. Then, of course, there's the fact that most kidnappers aren't physically gentle either, and don't seem to regret the injuring of their victims. This passage implies that all of that can be as harmful as murder, though it certainly doesn't say that it's wrong to subject people to stressful situations. Terrorism threatens, wounds, and kills indiscriminately. It is gravely against justice and charity. Catechism, paragraph 2297, third sentence. The key difference between terrorism and the just war doctrine that we discussed in episode 93 is the word indiscriminately. Wars may be fought in pure, legitimate defense, targeting only those who represent a genuine threat to other living people. But a terrorist is someone who attacks not just combatants, but non-combatants as well. This is because terrorists aren't looking to establish victory by force of arms. They just want to cause damage so that their cause will be recognized. However, the problem is that in the end, regardless of their reasons, the terrorist kills innocent people who aren't a threat to anyone, and that's always wrong. Torture, which uses physical or moral violence to extract confessions, punish the guilty, frighten opponents, or satisfy hatred, is contrary to respect for the person and for human dignity. Catechism, paragraph 2297, fourth sentence. Remember, in the Catholic Church, violence means acting against the will of God. It doesn't mean conflict or pain. Once this is understood, the rest of the quote is almost self-explanatory. If you're causing physical or moral harm to someone just because you want to punish or frighten them or satisfy yourself, that could easily result in their death, or even their spiritual death, the worst possible eventuality. Except when performed for strictly therapeutic medical reasons, directly intended amputations, mutilations, and sterilizations performed on innocent persons are against the moral law. Catechism, paragraph 2297, final sentence. As stated before, these are exactly the kinds of things that could make it impossible for a person to function normally in society, and because of that they represent a violation of their bodily integrity. Finally, in paragraph 2298, the Catechism discusses how cruel punishments and other cruel practices were once thought to be necessary to maintain a stable society, but we now know this isn't the case. 
First, this paragraph uses the term cruel practices for, I believe, a good reason. It's a rather elastic term in that it doesn't seem to refer to any practice specifically, but only to the cruelty of practices. In short, it's the cruelty which society doesn't need in order to remain stable. I don't know anyone who would argue with that. After all, cruelty is really just an inhumane attitude, a tendency to enjoy the suffering of others, and this is just the sort of thing that we don't need in order for a stable society to work. Secondly, this paragraph does not say that societies can survive on friendliness and goodwill. I bring this up because, unfortunately, the wording is such that this mistake could easily be made. No society can survive on friendliness and kindness alone, because those things just don't go deep enough to satisfy the human soul. And anyway, not everyone is going to cooperate with them. Some form of force is required in order to protect the innocent and bring justice to those who've suffered wrong at the hands of evildoers. The point of the paragraph is just to point out that there's no reason why this form of force should be cruel. That's it for the fifth commandment. Next time we'll be moving on to the sixth and asking, what did God mean by committing adultery? That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.